Hello and welcome to our podcast with Ulrika uh, on Rilke's, Rilke's and the Dark Interval, Letters on Grief, Loss and Death. Um, how are you? Very good. Thank you for having me today. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for being here. <laughs> We are so happy to see you here today. And today is the date of Rilke's uh, father's birth, uh, Joseph Rilke, but we will talk about that today. Uh, let's begin with the first question, if you want. Yep. Okay. Um, I want to ask a question about the book. Uh, what impressed you the most, personally? when you first read these letters? So I started reading Rilke's letters um, kind of by coincidence right after my father died. So my father died 20 years ago and that was about 10 weeks after 9-11 happened in New York. And I live in New York City, so 9-11 happened and I was safe and okay, but it was a very, very upsetting experience, of course. And then my father died about 10 or 12 weeks later in November, uh, too young really at age 70. And I was 35 years old and my son was one. So I was exactly halfway between my father and my son. And I kind of thought that was a very strange coincidence. And then my father died and then my son was one. And then I really had a very hard time during that year and I read Um, a passage from one of Rilke's letters that I found that is now in this book, The Dark Interval, that you mentioned. And that passage was very confusing to me and I couldn't really understand it. Um, and, but it sort of said something that I found, and I don't know where I found it, it's in some anthology probably. And I will go to this passage in a moment. And then I just kept on reading Rilke's letters and I didn't really quite know, to be honest, at that time, how many letters he had written, maybe 15,000 total. So I kept on getting more, more and more and more editions of the letters. And I would just sit in my son's room at night when he was sleeping and mark all the passages that spoke to me. And I didn't care what the letter really, who it was for and when it was written. And I wasn't as interested, a lot of people are, in the kind of philosophy of Rilke or the aesthetic of Rilke. I really only underlined the passages that said something to me, not that I understood it, but they felt, and I felt they were addressed to something that I wanted to sort of go back to. And then because I live in New York and I'm American, but I'm also German because I grew up in Germany. So I translated them because I wanted to share them with other people. So translation was a way for me to read them again and again and again, carefully and try to really understand. So translation was a way At some point, Wilke says something about translation. They really become part of you because you really have to have the words in your body to be able to say them again in another language. So the translation was my first real engagement with, with um, most of these letters. Yeah. Then, um, how does Rilke connect that with the fall in these letters? Because he talks about that so much? Um, so what I found that the letters, Rilke used these letters, uh, my sense is as a kind of rehearsal space or laboratory or workshop to work out a lot of his ideas that come up in the poems. Um, there are some of the poems that do no elegies, the other poems really deal with death. There, there's, he's a couple of poems called Death, Der Tod or something on death. But in the letters, he was able to talk to people about their experiences or his experiences. And the basic project, I think, of Rilke's poetry and of his life was to try to have a, in his view, better relationship to the fact of death. That death happens to all of us. We lose people and it will happen to us, we know. But he said, we have a very not unhealthy, he wouldn't use that word, an unproductive, not a good relationship with death because we repress it, we are afraid of it, we try to banish it, we try to pretend it's not there. And if you remember 
in his only novel, The Notebook of Malte Lauer Trigger, there's this whole long passage in the beginning how this patriarch is dying and has this very kind of elegant produced death. It's very stagey and theatrical. And that's for Wilke at some point is kind of the, the aim of life to die in a kind of meaningful, personal, appropriate way to us. I think Rilke ultimately moves beyond that and uh, thinks not we can have an appropriate death, but what if we were not quite as afraid maybe? Because I think the fear distorts our relationship to life as well. And to go to your point, Rilke talks about death because he really wants to figure out how to live his life well. And he says in many, many letters, which is very funny always, he says, oh, I can only give you advice because I'm totally incompetent and I don't even know what I'm doing. And he's, he's a bit of a hypochondriac and he, has, he ultimately gets sick and suffers a lot. So he's not super successful in life, as we would say. So he's trying to account for death because he said that's a way for us to realize we're not really fully alive. We're not fully in life because death keeps on distracting us. What can we say that when we look at the letters? Um, what can we say about that and the power in human beings then? Because we are so afraid, but is there any reason to be? Afraid? I think um, we are uncomfortable about death because we don't know it, we can't know it. It's really, it's, it looks like the opposite of life. Um, if it's either, and Rilke was born, as you know, a Catholic, brought up as a religious boy, went to church for a while, but ultimately gives up uh, the kind of doctrinaire faith because it kind of cloaks death in this promise of heaven and some kind of redemption or something. And he said, that's just probably, that may be true or not true, but it just covers over our fear. It allows us to live without fear and you're not as afraid of death, which is maybe productive, but he said, this fear still is there. Even if we go to church and think, okay, we'll be contained in the greater whole, we'll go to heaven or whatever happens. So the, the discomfort, this is really important, I think, to understand Rilke, the discomfort is what part of human nature is, that we feel uncomfortable about death. He doesn't want us to get over that and start feeling really super comfortable with death and say, oh, it's just part of life. In the, some of the letters, sometimes he comes close to it and he says, if you would only allow death to be in your life a little bit longer than your normal response, which is to run away from it, to repress it, to be afraid of it. But he said that discomfort, that fear is part of who we are. What if we stay with that for a bit longer? Would our experience be deeper? And in some ways I could ask the same question when you said people are really afraid to talk about death. The other part of Rilke's poetry that he's really interested in is love. And he says, in reality, people are also really afraid of love. Everybody thinks they want to be in love, they want to have romance, they want to find somebody, but they're very afraid of it as well in a weird way. Like you think about it, uh, people are very uncertain about it. There's a lot of insecurity. So love is comforting, supposedly, but it's also unsettling, disturbs us. We want love to be this kind of event in our lives that transformed us. So Rilke says those are the two sides of life, love and death, that allow us to experience something in ourselves that's greater than ourselves without religion. So this discomfort... Um, Rilke is not the recipe to get over your fear of death. Rilke is the, well, the poet who says, okay, if you can endure like one more minute, you may have gained something. That doesn't mean you're going to be sort of this blissful. And I, this is actually another conversation, but you're not a Buddhist suddenly and say, oh, everything is transient and I'm okay with that. And the Buddhists are not okay with it either. Okay, it doesn't mean like what Buddhist realism awareness means is not you're comfortable with loss. You just know it exists. What awaits us when we don't transform after we experience pain? Then, um, if we don't, if we. If we repress, like wait, uh, rephrase, ask me your question again, it's about pain, which is a part of Rilke and Rilke talks a lot about pain in the seventh elegy 
which is quite powerful and quite nice. He says, we waste pain. He says, Vergeude des Schmerzes. He said, we waste pain all the time. Um, and we should just know that actually pain is part of life. And we should be part of that should be something um, that we should be more comfortable with. But ask me a question again about pain. Okay. What awaits us? When we don't transform our pain or transform ourselves after we experience pain. I think what way does this mostly, <coughs> sorry, mostly how we live our lives. Most pain we don't transform, most pain we don't overcome and nothing good comes of it. So Rilke is not a, Forward says all pain can be made productive and useful, but what happens is too much pain actually is not processed. We don't acknowledge it. We go through it, suffer, we're in pain, and then we want to get out of it as quickly as possible, and we forget the experience. We want to just say, I was in pain, that was horrible, I don't want to even think about it. Rilke says, that's natural and human. At the same time, if you thought about it, if you stayed with that pain for a bit longer, and he's not talking about overwhelming, disabling pain, but some pain that we all experience all the time, every level of loss, we all lose things all the time, people, situations, opportunities, etc. If we stayed with that for a bit longer, we could grow. And this is a really key part when he said, what awaits us if we don't transform pain? This term transformation I use in the title of the book that I said they're called Letters on Love, Loss, Grief, Grief and Transformation. The German word that Rilke uses a lot for this is Wandlung, which is transformation or change. It's actually really strange that in English, one of the poems he wrote called Wandlung is translated as turning point, which is wrong because it's not a point, it's actually a process. So it's called not Wendepunkt, but turning, just turning. And Rilke says all life is transformation constantly. Life is change, life is things that become different. If we realize, if we allowed ourselves to be, stay with pain for a little bit, then what would await us perhaps is transformation of ourselves into something new. It's not clear what that would be. It's not better necessarily. If we don't do that, to your question, what awaits us if we don't deal with pain that we may just be stuck. And for Rilke, this kind of this feeling or this experience of being stuck, of not changing, of not moving forward is really terrifying. There, this is probably one of the few moments he coincides with Freud. And in 1915, Lou Andreas Salome introduces, introduces Rilke to Freud, which is kind of amazing. They meet in a hotel in Munich at the Psychoanalytic Congress. And Rilke says very famously, after he meets Freud, he said it's very interesting and he reads all of Freud's texts, everything that Freud will publish from then on gets mailed to Rilke right away and he reads it with great interest, but he says, I don't wanna be psychoanalyzed because psychoanalysis would scare the demons and the angels in my nature. It would basically exorcise my neurosis, but that's maybe what makes me productive. So we can turn your question into something else, say if you actually repress pain and don't stay with pain, you may also lose your creative potential to become something else. For Rilke, those things are tied together. So maybe pain is an opening and we can talk about that later. Ultimately, Rilke will be defeated by pain. He dies a very painful death uh, in 1926 of leukemia where he says pain, it's like there's nothing productive about it. Um. How does Rita discuss the concept of loss? Um, do we really lose our loved ones? Can we say that? Um, I mean, Rilke wrote a couple of poems that are very moving. Requiem uh, for Paula Modersohn Becker, which was a paint, who was a painter who he was in love with at the moment when he gets married to his wife, sort of 1900, 1901, Bob Sveda, when he's with a painter's colony. She dies very young. This painter was a really gifted painter. And do we really lose our loved ones? Yes, we do. There's really loss in life and the dead are dead. 
Then Rilke writes a requiem. And in this requiem, there's a very strange and kind of funny passage where sort of she returns like a ghost and he can feel her in his body. And I think what Rilke wants to suggest is that a couple of things that through poetry, maybe through art, through certain kinds of practices, the dead can be part of us. They're gone, but they're also part of us. They inhabit us. That is actually what grief is because grief over loss is actual physical pain. People who are grieving are physically in pain. That's really, and Rilke says, that's because the dead are gone, but we still experience their presence. So, so, so Rilke doesn't say the dead are with us in a real manifest life sense, but they, their presence in our lives can be made more real. And there's two parts to it. One is we are kind of haunted by the loss of people we loved. Um, and then this passage, and maybe I'll, I'll read this passage, which I used for the kind of prompt for my whole book, is where he says, the presence, the, the loss of a lost one can enrich our lives. So your question, what happens to the dead? Rilke says, they're gone. But something can be added to a, a life, not just subtracted. And this is in a letter he writes um, in 1908. And this passage for me was the one that was really confusing. And I couldn't understand this one part, why something is greater in our life after loss, because I didn't have this experience myself for a long time. And he writes, as to the influence of the death of someone near to those he leaves behind, it has long seemed to me that this ought to be no other than a higher responsibility. Does the person who passes away not leave all the things he had begun in hundreds of ways to be continued by those who outlive them if they had shared any kind of inner bond at all? The weight of this unexplained and perhaps greatest event, which only due to a misunderstanding has gained the reputation of being arbitrary and cruel, presses us, I think, increasingly more evenly and more deeply into life and places the utmost obligations on our slowly growing strength. So when you're asking what happens to the dead in our lives, when he says uh, they press us more deeply and evenly into life. And in German, he says, der, die Schwere dieses Unaufgeklärten drückt uns gleichmäßiger und tiefer ins Leben hinein and places the utmost responsibility in our growing strength. The weight of the loss for Rilke presses us more deeply into life that we actually have to live our lives. For me, that was really hard to understand after my father died because I actually felt very removed from life. I felt very numb. I didn't want to experience anything. Every morning when I woke up, I kind of, you have that weird uncanny feeling if you wake up and for a moment you had forgotten what was so weighing on you and then you wake up and you realize you're in grief and you're in pain and I couldn't understand what Rilke meant he said this presses us more deeply into life and what I think he means the dead are with us but now they are with us as lost and it is our obligation to make this loss be something that makes our lives deeper, richer, that we have to do more things. And the other part of this passage, which I found really interesting for me was, it spoke to me, and I don't really know why it spoke to me. It said, there's something where he said, a hundred, the, 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 the last one, wie balleste hingehen, der nicht sein hundertfach begonnen ist. Doesn't he leave a hundred times of the things he started? And my father died at 70 and he was a teacher. He was really active. He really loved life. Very, very joyful person. And he couldn't continue so many things. So I felt, I intuited something that Wilke said. He said, oh, so some of the things he couldn't complete are now weighing on me. And to turn this weight into something where he's like, oh, actually, you can get up in the morning and do things, and he can no longer do that. That's what Wilke wants to say about loss. What if that loss, not in a kind of dumb way, oh, you're supposed to enjoy life every day, live your life to the fullest, but actually literally it weighs on you. And I like this metaphor, it really weighs on you, it kind of weighs you down, but from this, you're more deeply in, put into life. Does that make sense? You know, what, like if you're thinking about your own experience, sort of when you go through loss or something, you don't yeah, think, see. right? Mm -hmm. uh, actually, I, I talked about that. Sometimes maybe it's uh, 
little, <laughs> little example, but my dad passed away, you know, and he he loves drinking tea in the morning. Now I do that because my dad used to do that. Actually, I don't like drinking tea, but I I just feel like I should do that after the reading this letter and. I can tell this about other areas of my life. I want to continue because now I have more reasons to do that. Yeah, but it's funny you don't even like tea, but there's a part, Rilke would say something about that. He said, we, we, we can't bring the dead back, but they are, they, are, they are in a strange way with you at that moment when you're drinking tea and you think, you think, and this sounds also banal, but look, it's not a poet who shies away from the everyday. Like he's a poet of imminence. He thinks about the everyday. So when you're drinking your tea, you know in your head, I'm drinking a tea my father can no longer drink. But it's much deeper than that. You're actually experiencing the tea with this kind of awareness in the back of your mind. Like I'm drinking tea now. I'm alive. I'm drinking tea that's what he used to do that connects you to him in a different way from your from your head you know it's your body actually it's your, so Rilke would say that is partly how the dead are with us that you're doing this and then that moment and it's kind of a nice ritual in a way but Rilke would say yeah that's all we can do is like do something like that and then the other part the greater part that you said that then you feel how do I spend my day today doing things that maybe I infused with this kind of steeped in this kind of awareness of my, like what I felt very much, my father can no longer do certain things. And I do lots of things and I, I kind of, the thing I really regret, the only thing when I think about this, and you probably, I don't know if you share this at all, but I feel sometimes I wish I could just tell my father I'm doing certain things that I know he would take pleasure in. He would say, oh, I'm happy for you. Not that it's not a matter of impressing him and being proud. He would say, oh, I'm happy you're happy doing this. Like I would like to be able to share that. So I kind of feel the joy of producing things or doing something or what you're doing your work. That would be nice to share with that person. Enrique says, uh, says that his father is very effective, even though he is dead now. And it makes so sense to me because before my dad passed away, I didn't feel in this way. And now I feel I feel more connected to him somehow, even though he's not here. And this is partly what you're saying. I don't, you know, this is the difficulty how we talk about these things. Like actually someone wrote to me recently, I have a friend who had a terrible loss and he was sent this book by coincidence. And then he called me and said, oh my God, I didn't know you produced this book. And I was like, yeah, that, that's me. I said, I didn't produce this book. I just am the facilitator. I just, this is Rilke's words. I was just, I have the ability to write in English. That's all I did. <laughs> but he said, you must have been so close to your father. And I said, actually, I was not that close to my father. I think part of my grief was that I wasn't as close as I wished I had been. And I never had this opportunity to. And so the letters, a lot of the letters, like this, they're very moving to me because they say, to some people, they say, you were very close to this person. And to other people, Rilke says, you were not that close to this person. They were a little bit distant. And that's how life is. But now is your moment to reflect on your relationship. And now is your moment to think. And it's not a matter of just regret or something, but to think, okay, um, how do you live your life now in other relationships, maybe, to say, you know, you don't want to miss an opportunity. And the and as we know, relationships are not easy. So I was not as close with my father, maybe for many reasons. And it wasn't an easy thing. Rilke would never say anything is easy, like it could be easy, but this could be a way to think, okay, this loss motivates you to be deeper in relationships. And there's this one other passage I really like. It's, it's in the second letter, wait, I'll read to see, which I love. Um, I thought it was so moving when I read this the first time. Second letter. And he says, uh, 
Um, oh, maybe it's the fourth one, sorry. Oh, so this is a letter he writes to Zidoni, not enough on Bodo team. So Zidi is one of his very, very close friends. And then he says, I am, he writes to her and she's grieving over the loss of her brother. And he says, who committed suicide. And he says, I'm very concerned when I imagine how strangled and cut off you currently live, afraid of touching anything that is filled with memories and what is not filled with memories. You will freeze in place if you remain this way. You must not, dear. You have to move. You have to return to his, thing, his things. You have to touch with your hands his things, which through their manifold relations and affinity are after all also yours. You must see me. This is the task that this incomprehensible fate imposes upon us. You must continue his life inside of yours insofar as it was unfinished. His life has now passed on to yours. That to me, to write to your friend whose brother committed suicide is really very difficult. And he's not saying this is an easy task, but he said, you cannot remain frozen. You have to actually handle his things, engage with him, know that, and then you have to continue his life inside of yours. For me, that was a really moving passage to write to somebody. And I think it's written with such incredible love to say, this is going to be the most difficult thing in your life. But live your life now. And, and grief is this, I think, I always felt grief was, it takes you out of life because you just don't feel you want to enjoy the day. You don't feel, you also feel guilty maybe, or like it's not a nice day. And for Wilke to say, no, this is, you must live, live your, his life in yours. Did you, have you ever experienced that people around you um, expect expected you to be uh, to remain in this depressive place like because I think that I tell people after my dad passed away I'm okay and and I am trying to learn about that learn from that but they are like I just feel like that they couldn't think that someone can be okay after such a situation because I used to think that before I know that. Well, it's a, it's a question when I, the, what we talked about earlier, this idea of transformation, what is okay after this event? Because you're not going to be the same. So people want you either want you to be stuck in grief or if you say I'm okay, they're like, how could you be okay? As if you have some <laughs> kind of formula responsibility, like you have to sort of, you can't be okay. If you listen to Rilke, if you say, I'm okay today, I'm having an okay, I'm, like Rilke say, try to have a good day. What if actually, like he said, that would be a remarkable thing for someone to say, like I lost somebody and, and they would say, I'm having a really good day today in the memory of this person. I'm having a wonderful day. Like I love my tea this morning. You don't even like tea, which is kind of funny. And it's sort of like say, I, I <laughs> You know, like Rilke would be something like not between okay and depressive. He would say, what if you have a good day in the wake of loss? That would be accounting for loss because he said, that's the, the foil, the background of our lives that you'd say, if you could say to somebody, I'm having a really great day today. I'm having a wonderful day in the memory of my father. For Rilke, those two things together, I mean, because what you're saying, people say like, you should be either depressed or you're not authentically grieving. It's like, there's no recipe. And I, I like these letters so much because like everybody grieves differently. People, there's no recipe, no formula, no path. And Wilke says, you keep on trying and trying and trying. But if you think about that, if you were able to say to somebody, how are you doing? I'm so sorry, your father. It's like, oh, I'm having a wonderful day today, thinking of him. Like that, those two thoughts are so complicated for us because we think, oh, we think of him that we cannot have a good day. And Wilke would say, no, we think of this person, that's why we're having a good day, because we are filled with that memory. I will say that when they ask me. <laughs> I, right, I would, but it's so hard because people would look at you and think you're not properly remembering him. And you say, no, that's, the, that's what, according to Rilke, that would be properly remembering your father. Um, okay, so... What are Rilke's views on the concept of consolation? 
Uh, he basically says you cannot be consoled. Uh, there's no <laughs> consolation. He says, which to me, one of the passages in one of the letters, he says, um, time does not console, but it places events into an order so that you can refer back to this moment, this day when you got the news, when you learned this, when this happened, this loss, and you know, this happened, and I can now talk about it without having all the affect and the emotion maybe every single time, but the affect and emotion in reality never really goes away. If you really loved somebody, like this happens to people and it doesn't get easier in this way. It gets easier because you can refer to it as an event in your life and you know what consequences it had, but he would say, you're not consoled over the loss. It's not, oh, the loss doesn't matter anymore. So the word consolation for him is really, it's something he doesn't trust. He said kind of the church does that. He said, oh, you're consoled. He went to heaven and he said, no, I still experience. And there I think he's so honest because people still experience the loss 25 years later. And that's considered irrational or unreasonable. Like Freud would have said something like that's a melancholic attachment and you have to let go of it at some point. And then there's all these new studies, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross who said the stages of grief, there's denial, anger, negotiation, acceptance, moving forward, all mixed together. And you look at what's saying, you never move forward. The goal is not in life to move forward. The goal in life is to move more deeply into life. So more deeply into life would be to say, I'm not consoled. I miss him every day. That for him would be more honest rather than saying, oh yeah, I found consolation in something else. So to say, no, I'm not consoled at all. That's a loss I experienced. And I think there's a kind of idea in our world that we think, oh, you have to move on. You have to get over it, process it. And we'll go and say, well, it covers up something fundamental. Then consolation might be an obstacle or transformation. Or is that right? I think so. Like, if you think about that, like, you know, we, we want to be consoled, but on a larger level, Rilke's project is we want to be consoled and think <laughs> we will all live forever and nothing will be lost. and. There's nothing transient. And he said, like Rilke says, it's, it's very famous sentence, um, be ahead of all parting. So be ahead of all parting. Like you should, as soon as something is going to end and some experience or some event, some person is going to be over, leave your life, you should be prepared of it. I wrote this in a book I wrote a couple of years ago um, on Rilke's very funny engagement with these Buddha statues. So Rodin, the sculptor for me, worked at this huge Buddha statue in the garden. And then Rilke's wife gave him actually the speeches of the Gautama Buddha, which were translated from Pali into, I think Pali in, in Sanskrit into German for the first time. Rilke opened the Buddha speeches and closed them right away and said, I don't want to read this. It's too close to me. So what can, what consolate, what, what this would mean to be ahead of all parting would be to be fully aware that the life, that the world is transient and we will lose things all the time. Things pass out of the world. A Buddhist would say to you, and I had actually a, a Rinpoche, a Tibetan kind of Buddhist teacher come to my class once and one of my students said, oh, so at that moment when you're full awareness, are you totally free? Like you're free from all of our Western attachments. We go through loss and grief and this if Rinpoche, this Buddhist teacher said, oh, no, 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 no then you're totally attached to all the suffering in the world and you're aware of all of it and then you're really bound to the world. And then the student said, oh, yeah, I don't want that. The student thought this kind of Buddhist attitude towards, toward loss would be a liberation and the Buddhist teacher said, no, it's deepening your attachment to the world. I think Rilke wants to say something like that. If you actually acknowledge that loss is part of life, that doesn't mean loss doesn't affect you and you can get over it quickly, and you're sort of this kind of surface person, and you say, oh, once you realize that loss of part of life, you're much deeper in life, and you experience the intensity of that. So it's the reversal of going into a kind of direction away from loss, denial of loss, suppression or repression, to say, no, once you know loss really exists for us, that pulls us into life's, what he calls, deepest mysteries. 
And Rika says uh, in one of the, his lines, for there is no place that doesn't see you, you must change your life. Like he doesn't say you could, you must, because after experiencing that loss, <laughs> he don't have nothing to do. Wait, ask me this question in a different way, but sort of this line, this famous line, you must and live and end and you must change your life, which a lot of people take kind of the essence of Rilke's poetry, I guess. So, um, I mean, the question is like, you can't not change. It's kind of a funny, you know, directive, like you must change your life, like, but you're changing constantly. Your life has changed, we know that. So it's really maybe also saying you must change your life. You must change your attitude toward life to acknowledge that life will be changed all the time. Like it's, I don't think it's so, I thought about this a lot and I don't think it's really just, oh, change your life, get a new job, move to a new country, date a new person, <laughs> you, know? you know? It's more like uh, realize that nothing is permanent. Like that would be an adjustment and that would mean your life is deeper. I don't know if that makes sense <laughs> to you. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I was thinking about that too. Like, it's not like leave your job and leave your country. <laughs> right. Which is kind of like this idea of positive psychology and get a life hack and do this every morning and you'll be better off. And look, there would be like, well, that's not, that's not changing your life. That's actually just trying to maximize some idea of success or something, changing your life would be changing yourself and your own attitude toward life, not as this product you have to create and achieve something, but so something you are in in a very deep way, in a, way in, in a word that we don't use that much anymore, in a very authentic way, kind of in a grounded way. Actually, it reminded me of Emerson's saying, <laughs> Um, travel is the fool's paradise, like, yes, <laughs> right, exactly, so, exactly. Like, it's, it's almost escape from the self rather than deepening the self, yeah. Then, how does Rita approach the meaning of the loss of the father? Um, I think he has a, I think he has a comment, I think, in one of the letters he says. When our father passes away, it's a very fundamental loss because we are exposed to the horizon of our own existence. He's, he kind of says in this very visual, beautiful way, our parents are kind of blocking the view of the horizon, which and that horizon is ultimately our existence on life, which is, has a horizon because we will die at some point. That time frame, once our father dies, he says we have a direct view of our own mortality. So when our fathers die, we are faced with our loss as the next one, if it was the natural order of things, there are also other things happening. But I think that's kind of um, beautiful. Then Rilke has a very strange moment. I think there's a, he has a picture, it's a photograph, and it's not really a photograph, it's not a daguerreotype, it's a kind of um, silver engraving of his father, and he removes it from its frame and wants to clean it, and he basically erases his father's face at some point. He wants to clean it and he says he scrubbed it and then his father was gone. That's be long before his father died. So he had a very strange relationship and he talked about that. He said, what did I just do? I just erased my father's image in the one picture I had. Um, so the father is this important person because, you know, those of us who have or had fathers, you know, they, they, they structure our relation to the past in a way, they become this image of what the past is. And once it's removed, we are directly, we are next to, we will be, we will be in the past as well. We are next in line. And personally, uh, how did it affect you losing your father? You know, um, I, think it affected me in a few ways and one of them was that as I said I by coincidence happened to have my son who's not 21 um, was exactly one and it made me 
think much more consciously about what kind of father I wanted to be. And I felt I unfortunately didn't have enough time to get really close to my father or talk to my father. And I think my father really tried and didn't do such a great job, but he tried in his own way. And I think, and in some ways it motivated me to be more aware and more conscious of how I wanted to live my life. And the second thing is because you experience the same thing. My father's life was cut off. So I could sort of start to see it and say, what parts of me are repeating certain things he did and what parts of me are different. Like I could, because it's a contained story now um, and there's no more interaction. It was my interaction with myself and thinking more about how did he shape me into who I am and what parts of that do I actually want to cultivate? And there's some parts of me that I actually really like, and I know they're from my father. My father had this talent to talk with people and he loved people. And I also love people. Like I'm a very gregarious person. I kind of sometimes think I'm really happy that I have this part. And I'm also happy that I know it comes from him. I don't know, how did it change you, do you think? I, I believe that losing a parent can affect someone that um, in this way, you become a better parent because you reflect on that much. Um, you, reflect, you reflect on them a lot and the concept of father or mother. So you become a better one, I think. Yeah, yeah. But I don't have kids and maybe I can experience that later on. Because now I think then how to be a better parent after my dad has away. Normally, I, I wouldn't ever, even think about that, for example. And for most people, I think, who have, like, for many people, not for most people, for some people, for Rilke certainly, the father is also kind of a figure that gives some direction to life. They have expectations, they have a profession. Rilke was put in a military academy as a young boy. He hated it. His father was probably sort of wishing to have a better career in the military. So there's the kind of doubling. So I think the, the father figure is often a figure for, you can see your own choices. And are you sort of trying to satisfy this expectation? It may not be real, it may just be imagined. But I think for Rilke, the father was the kind of, what's my expectation in life of myself? So in letters to a young poet, to Franz Xaver Kapus, he writes so much about what's your expectation? Should you join the military? Should you become a poet? What you should do with your life? Should you take it seriously? What's your sexuality? Who should you be involved with? How should you treat women? How should you treat yourself? These are all kind of written from a position of Rilke who was 26 at that time, a young man, but kind of, He's trying to open up this space to say, there's all this expectation on you, on all of us. Usually the father has a really important role in all these expectations, but take the time to think about, are they real for you, this expectation? If you should take a profession, if you should get married, if you should settle in this town. So your father can become a kind of frame through which to see some of these and think, why am I, why, who am I trying to impress? Like my family is very funny and they sometimes say like, okay, why are you writing so many books? Who are you trying to impress? And I say, I'm not trying to impress, but I would like to make my father happy. And that's kind of, you can channel it in a good way, but there's something I think Rilke would say, your, <laughs> father, your father's like a lens to, to see your own expectations. You know, what do you want to do with your life comes partly from your relationship with your father in many cases, I think. Right? Like, if you think about that, like, what do you want to do with your life? It's probably something he would have cared about, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I want to ask a question about the invisible. Rilke says we are the beings of the invisible. How can we interpret the relationship between the invisible and the transformation? That's really, that's a really great question. It's kind of really, it's, um, so he says, we are the bees of the invisible. We wildly gather the honey of the visible in order to store it in the great golden hive of the invisible. 
So he says, we have to transform. There's this word again of transformation. So when I said earlier, we're trying to transform loss into a deepening of life, not into a gain, a benefit or something. So he says, what we're trying to do, we're trying to transform the visible and tangible things into, and then he goes on in this letter, 1926 letter to his Polish translator. He says, we're transforming what we see and what we touch visible and tangible into the invisible vibration and excitations of our own nature. And what he means is we have to transform these bees of the invisible and the, everything that we see, perceive, sensory experience into something that's meaningful for us. We don't just absorb it like a recording device, like a camera or something like that, and we store it and then it gets spewed back out. But our job in the world, and this is where Rilke really becomes most clear, he says, the meaning of our lives is to live our lives and to make the things that happen to us that we see, experience and touch into something that has meaning. There is no meaning in the world for him. There's none, everything happens, all this stuff happens, but it becomes meaningful through our engagement with it. He's a poet. So he says writing poems about certain things gives them a kind of other life. So all these poems he has about hydrangeas and carousels and panthers and flamingos and whatnot but ultimately about the dead, about people he lost, about the things we cannot reach. So it's easy to think, okay, you wanna make a panther come back to life in a poem. Okay, fine, it's a panther, make it a really good poem. Then he talks about the dead, what we talked about earlier, are they with us? He said, by speaking about them in a meaningful way and really letting them inhabit us, they come back to life, they are properly remembered. The whole world has to be properly remembered. And he can, that I kind of like, he's basically saying you're walking through the street and you're seeing the trees and the houses and cars and people and whatnot. All of this has to be processed by you. And we use these kind of technological metaphors or biological metaphors. But the dead also have to be processed. They're contained within us and by us. And if you're a poet, you can recreate them in poetry. But I think where Wilke is really nice, it's, if you're not a poet, you can recreate them through your life's actions. So people, you actually live your life in an awareness of the things you've experienced. And that kind of awareness gives them another shape or form. It doesn't have to be a sculpture or a poem or a symphony. Not all of us are capable of doing that, but it has to be your kind of decisions and how you live your life are a reflection of what you've absorbed from life. So if we look at this, this kind of weird cycle, life is out there, all the stuff is out there, we can see it, so this is the visible, and then we're the bees of the visible, we transform it in our minds in, in this golden hive of the invisible. That transformation is our task. Essentially, it is as human beings, it's our task to give meaning to ourselves. And he's very suspicious of all these product programs like the church, ideologies, uh, religion, um, state power, that you attach yourself to a greater meaning that's not something you yourself created. It's a cop out. I mean, in Rilke himself falls prey to that. His politics are very strange occasionally, but sometimes he's seduced by these kind of leaders or you actually attach yourself, and this is something important for the podcast, or people attach themselves to Rilke, to a poet and say, that's my guide to life. Say, no, actually Rilke would say, I'm the last person to help you. You have to, Find your own language for what you're saying. So I always feel these, these letters are kind of useful to get to, but then ultimately you have to do the work yourself. Yeah. He also recomm recommends to uh, Franz Kafka to go inside instead of taking a drive. Right. <laughs> Yeah, and very I like helpful. very helpful, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But these letters, I think the letters to the young poet are um, amazing because they contain his entire poetics. Like they're sort of funny because they're written to a teenager and they're so popular. And you know, I retranslated them and I actually I wrote an introduction to the English edition that sold in Germany, <clears throat> which is funny, which I'm very proud of because it's with Insel Verlag, which is Rilke's original publisher. So they published my English translation because a lot of tourists in Germany, they want to buy a book and they don't read German. So they buy Rilke in English, which is really nice. So in some ways for me, okay, that's, you know, I'm happy, I'm proud this book got published, great. 
I kind of made these words my own, recreated them in English, and now sharing them with people. To me, that's a very Rilkean exercise. So I, like, I had to absorb his words, really think about them, recreate them, publish them, and now people can sort of be inspired or find some something in them that's useful for them. And I always say, if they find one sentence that's useful, that's incredible. Like one sentence is enough. That's a gift. And I feel that's this kind of task of transformation. You absorb something and you give it back to other people. I was so surprised that um, he wrote these letters at a very young age. I know. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I thought I, I didn't I didn't have any smart thoughts when I was that age at all. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about um, a future death point that still affects us. Uh, if we think about poetry, can we say that the words of a future death poet? are independent, independent of time and place yeah. because they are the product of our soul. Yeah, I think so. And I think poetry is really remarkable because um, since a lot of poetry is rhymed and it has the kind of uh, very fundamental human structure of re repetition and rhyme and sound patterns that are actually what we experience when we're very, very young children because that's how our caregivers talk to us through repetition and little songs and lullabies. It's very comforting for us to have language repeated and rhymed. And I think that part of poetry allows us to read poetry from hundreds, even thousands of years ago and let us touch it. It touches us because it's part of the human rhythm of part of our physical, of our being in the world. That there are poems we can read today and we think they were written in 1650 or something like that, like Gaspar Astampa or Michelangelo comes at Rilke translated. They actually are not totally alien to us because they correspond to the rhythms of how we are in the world. They correspond, first of all, to our breathing patterns. So all of poetic diction is patterned on how people speak and breathe. It's like a song. So this slight connection between rhymed language and our breath, which is a very, very important thing for Rilke, how we breathe in and out, because we're constantly between sort of in and out, breathing, not breathing. I think that's why poetry can go through time and sort of be timeless and touch people and speak to people from completely different worlds who have nothing to do with this. So someone like Emily Dickinson can touch us, who lived in Amherst in 1848, or or Shelley, or who knows who. So for us, I think that's really the remarkable part of language, that it kind of cuts through time and, and, and opens up something in us that we didn't even know we could, that could be touched. I find this very strange that um, he finds daily language, using daily language, um, a little bit annoying for an artist. For example, you, he says you write with the language you think with that, and you order a meal also with that. I think it was interesting. Yeah, I know he's okay. jealous because Rodin sculpts in clay. <laughs> yeah. because he can take his hands and take a bunch of clay and do that. But I actually think Vilka also kind of maybe says that and maybe maybe he's a little bit saying, oh, I wish I was this kind of artist who could sort of leave my day job and then go to my art. And they said, I do it all the time. That's why I was so fascinated in the letters. And I always loved that Vilka would write sometimes 20 letters in one morning, which is completely unimaginable. And they're very beautiful letters because I think he tricked himself in writing letters by sort of starting to write his poetry but pretended, oh, I'm just writing a letter. And the letters are sometimes so amazing. And he would copy passages from his letters into his diaries. In 1922, I think he says, the letters are as significant in my work as the poetry and the prose, which is really remarkable. He says the letters are as important. Like, and to this day, we don't have a complete edition of the letters. We have all these different editions, which is really strange to me. 
But I think when he says, I wish I was an artist who could sort of go out of the daily life, I also think it's really like a strength that he orders an omelet and then he writes an elegy in the same medium. Like he says, can I get an omelet and a cup of coffee? And then he writes an elegy because sometimes in his, in his poems, he can interrupt himself when he has the most formal, amazing philosophical language. And then something incredibly concrete comes in, like a really direct image. And that I think allows a lot of people, a lot of people I think love Rilke because it's very difficult things like you talked about earlier about death and confronting loss and these very difficult, uncomfortable things. But there are moments when the image becomes so graphic and so real to us that we can sort of hold on to it. Like he says, death is like the sort of the bottom of a cup with some dried coffee in it or something. And you're like, yeah, that's what death is like. This thing that you want to wash out of the cup or something. This, this concreteness, I think, is a huge advantage for him. So when he says, oh, Dan is this amazing person and everything, like, I, say, I can order an omelet and I can write an elegy in the same, in the same breath, basically. I want another question, um, the last question, actually. Rika says the spirit cannot make itself so small that it concerns nothing but our existence in the here and now. Then can we say that uh, poetry, the product of our souls, um, cannot make itself so small? because it continues, even though we are not here anymore. Well, I didn't totally get the question, ask me again. Um, when we think about the poetry, we write uh, poems and the poems um, has effect, even though we are not here anymore, like we are future dead. And Rilke, as Rika says, the spirit cannot make itself so small that it concerns nothing but our existence in the yeah. here and now. Can yeah. we say the same thing for the product of our souls or spirits? Yeah, I think so. I think I think that's really that's a really great question. I think it's really interesting the way you think about that. I think when he says nothing, the spirit is not so small to only be concerned with our here and now, there's something greater. He said, it's not God looking over us or this greatness, but he said something in us can touch other people in a way that goes beyond us. That's amazing in a way for Rilke. Like Hannah Arendt, who, the philosopher who wrote a very strange essay on the Duino Elegies in the 1930s, actually, one of her first published essays she writes with her husband then, she says, human beings have this capacity to start something in the world that has enormous repercussions and they can always create something new. He said that we can add something to the world that actually affects so many other people long after we are gone, gives us this capacity to reach beyond our own time. So I think your question is sort of, is it the human soul? Is it the human creativity, human originality, human spirit, or something like that? But I think Rilke very much believes something in us can go beyond us and touch other people. Um, and I think you're right. That sort of goes to when the, the spirit is never that small. So there's something a little bit greater. Language may give, give language was Rilke's thing. That was his medium. It gave him access to that greatness. Um, but it's a really interesting question of whether there is actually something that the, and partly what we talked about earlier, that we can contain in our mind and in our body, the memory of our fathers. And they, in a weird way, can for moments come to life in us through our behavior, through the way we are. And it's always when people say to you, oh, like your father used to do that. Like he, he looked like that or something like that. Or he would, you know, oh, like, yeah, he liked that. He would hold a cup like this, something. You don't even know that. So there's a kind of life beyond that in us. I think Rilke was really interested in that. Then um, my last question, but I want to, I would like to talk more if you want. Um, how did your relationship with your death change 
after he passed away. It's a kind of personal question, man. I wonder. We don't know. It's kind of hard to say. I ask this because people people think that there is no change after someone has away in terms of relationships. Oh, I think it totally changes because we change if we really think about it. Don't you think that it's not static? It doesn't get stopped at this point and it stays the same. But you think a lot about what that person was in your life. And I think that a lot, that's what Rilke maybe means. By thinking a lot about who that person was in your life, it makes you actually think more about yourself. So you change and then you think of this person differently. So I think it changes quite a bit. What do you think in terms of this question? Like how do you, does, do you think your relationship stayed the same? No, and it changed. I think it's like there is still a communication even though he's not here. And it amazes me because I, I used to think that it couldn't be in that way. If we lose someone, um, like it's a real loss. But now I experience it is not. Hmm. Maybe so I'm, is, so I'm so romantic, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but so what is I'm it? It's not, yeah, it's, it's, there's still a presence, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But they're not present, seeming to me. Yeah. And, ah, uh, my favorite question <laughs> I, I'm asking right now. Um, Rinke talks about learning to die on a daily basis. Right. Um, we all know more or less how to live, or we think we know that. Yet, how can we learn how to die? It's so interesting oh. to tell someone to learn how to die. I think, um, I think we have no idea how to live. Like, we don't know how to live at all, which is, of course, like everybody knows we struggle. So I think learning to die is maybe, it sounds so intimidating and so massive so maybe if you could go through your day and think whatever happens today the things that i'm not happy with the disappointments the injuries the hurt the pain what actually you thought oh this is going to happen that is part of life a flower is going to bloom and then wither and die and that's part of life and i can see it for what it is and actually go with it rather than resist it, fight it, get angry, deny it, pretend it didn't happen. So that, that would be enough. Like death is a little big maybe to say you can learn to die, but if we learn to actually live with these kinds of experiences a bit, a bit more rather than immediately react defensively, that would be a lot. Um, so I think it's sort of, you know, to learn to die like, and then Rilke, as I said, when he dies in 1926, he writes this very moving, beautiful letter to Lou Andrea Salome and says, I tried to integrate death into life. My whole work is about that and I failed. I'm dying, I'm in pain, it's no use. And I always thought for a long time that this was kind of sort of saying the whole project failed. But then when I'm preparing for this podcast, I thought about it a lot more and I thought, no, he's not saying he failed. He said, every single day, we have to make an effort, every hour to do this. It's not you figure it out and now you're sort of some saint walking through life and death doesn't touch you. You say it's a daily practice. That's why when you, your question is learn to, learn to um, not be afraid of death every single day. You have to do it over and over and over and over. It's a practice, not a point. You don't reach it and then you're done and you move through it. You say every single day because life is, Life is both for real because so incredibly rich, so many things happen in life, and so incredibly poor because so many things are taken away from us. So I think the shifting is to a daily practice, a state of becoming, a state of transformation, not an end point, you mastered it. Like when people ask you, are you okay now? 
And you're like, what is that supposed to mean? Like, I'm done with this or I'm not like, it's as if you've concluded this part of your life where you lost your father. And now from now on, are you supposed to forget him? Like, it doesn't make sense like that, right? Every day is a new negotiation with that experience. And your relationship with that of your father changes every day it's so interesting it doesn't remain same it's, it's like it's like it's it and it's also it's, it almost like has a presence in your life right it's like mm -hmm. sometimes, sometimes it's very painful sometimes it's kind of not there Rilke has this really bizarre um, analogy at some point he says it's like a very shy little animal that sits under your table and sometimes you could give it a little piece of sugar and it would come closer but it's very afraid of you and I'm like but it's sometimes it's very present and some days it doesn't really touch you. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's like someday I'm going to somewhere with my dad. It's like someday I don't see him at all. Like it's that kind of relationship. Right, right. <laughs> and learning to die on a daily basis, basis remind, reminds me of something like that. If we get angry about something or extremely depressed, I don't know. Um, we die in terms of not living our lives in that moment. Like um, to focus on our purpose, for example. We are obsessed with something that drains us. What do you think? Yeah, I just, um, I keep on thinking about what you said like a minute ago, sorry. Like you said, it changes every day. It's kind of a remarkable thing to say that people think you experience this loss and it's the static thing and it's not a static thing in your life. It's a dynamic thing. It has its own contour sometimes it it will ruin your day it really weighs you down and sometimes maybe you can take some inspiration from it and say oh like i'll i'll actually appreciate the day more like it gives me this kind of what everybody wants like oh it makes you live life more fully but it's different every day and i think that's really what rilke wants us to get to sort of say it's it's a different a new relation and we have some part in shaping it mm -hmm. it's not this thing it's just pure um, mindless pain um, because it's different and then once you look at it it's this kind of this thing that's actually weirdly like it's almost as if it's living in you um, mm -hmm. there may be a more productive way of related it's really I actually think that's really helpful when you said it's different every day mm -hmm. and I think Rita says we, we human beings are powerful in terms when it comes to that and i think from my own experience i was like um one of my neighbor lost her daughter in a horrific way years ago and i was hesitating to be close to her because i was thinking that she must be sad right now she must um, be very depressive right now and when you after experience my dad my dad's dad I'm like as I told you I'm okay and I can be okay after that even after that so it shows me that we are really powerful as human beings yeah I mean this powerful like, like he has this really kind of startling sentence and someone wrote me a letter two weeks ago about the sentence he saw a guy like a young guy who who committed suicide in Paris and he's being pulled out of the river it's like your sturdy strong guy and he said if only a tiny part of this power he would use for his life that he'd actually used to kill himself it's remarkable he says Zorilka says that we have these reserves of power sometimes we can't find them we can't see them they're buried under so much pain or something like that but he said we can activate this power sometimes Oh, yeah. The lines were so powerful. 
Yeah, but it, it, it's a strange image. It kind of stuck with me always. <laughs> <laughs> so there were my questions. So I, I just want to say, like at the end, I think you know what I said earlier. I really mean this. Like, if anything in real life, half a sentence can help somebody get through a day. That's amazing. I think Rilke really wanted in these letters to help people and literally to say, not I'm going to give you the solution. I'm going to give you the answer to your grief. But if you can feel better for 10 minutes, and we know from these letters that all the people who got them, the recipients, they kept them for a lifetime. They held on to them. They read them many, many times because they felt, oh, someone is actually paying attention to me in this very confusing moment. So I always feel... It's not that Rilke is going to make you feel better or what you said earlier, console you. But if there's a little tiny, a half a sentence, a word that feels, oh, this actually corresponds to what I'm feeling. I'm not totally alone. That's a lot. Like that to me is sort of really important because I think grief is so devastating and pain is so devastating. And if some moment you can feel I'm not alone or I could actually read something and get through my day, that's a lot already from real time. Yeah. And Rita doesn't say he or she will go to heaven to console, or you have other lo loved ones around you to console someone. Like, when I heard these sentences, I felt like they don't understand me at all. And partly this is like this experience of like, I think I learned this a little bit maybe from the letters. We don't understand. Like, and I actually don't understand what people go through and that's okay to say, look, I, I can't imagine what you're going through. And that's, and that gives people a space to say, yeah, you don't know, you have no idea because then it's not like, oh, you should feel like this now, you should feel like that. It's a year ago, you should feel better. There's no recipe, no order. So I think Rilke, all he wants to give people this space to say, we don't know, which is also kind of an amazing, like it's an amazing mystery about human beings. We don't even know what the other person is going through. And I think Rilke was very open to that. He said, we don't know. We just don't know what you're going through. And that's actually an opening to a depth in you. But maybe you could have the space to say, I'm going through this. These, and you, like for the other person not to say, and this is another piece where, why I wrote this book, because I feel a lot of people are very speechless in the face of loss. And you don't know what to say to anybody. And I think the most important thing to say is to say, I don't know what you're going through. Um, I'm with you. If you need help, I can be there. That's enough. And not to say, oh, I went through this myself. It's different. Like we both talked about, we, we went through different experiences. You know, it's not like I can say, oh, I felt like this. And you're like, I didn't feel like this. <laughs> so, so the sense of being not understood is something like, like you're not going to be, like people are not going to get it. And they should give you the space to say, oh, how do you feel actually? Right, And then you could say, I feel fine today, but that doesn't mean I don't feel the loss. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> right. Such a deep, deep talk. <laughs> I know, I know. Well, I, thank you so, I mean, thank you so much. It's really nice of you to invite me. It's really great. I really am quite... I mean, I, as I said, like I feel this is like a service to the world. I'm happy I was able to find these letters and put them out. And I, it's very moving to me that because I did not write them, Rilke wrote them. People write to me from all over the world and say, look, this was helpful. And I always feel, wow, that wasn't me. That was Rilke. I'm glad this is out there now. I thank you and we thank you for Ella for these letters too, because they mean a lot to us. Yeah, so I'm happy um, that they're they are, that they are to the out in English, the dark interval, and then they're also out in German, which they have a different title. What is it called in title? Oh, jeder Tag ist der Anfang des Lebens. So every day is the beginning of life. So they're out in these different editions. I think there's a uh, Korean edition. 
Uh, I think there may be a Portuguese edition, so they are available in other languages as well, which is nice. And it's so nice that I just, it's just a feeling. I feel that the letters help you transform through your pain to be engaged with letters. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. All, right. Okay. All right, well, thank you. Nice talking to you today. I uh, thank you too.